Experience Life, welcome to week two of our series called One Prayer. Like I told you last week, we're joining now over 1,700 other churches. Last week I told you 1,400, 300 have joined us in the last week for this five-week series on prayer. It's about a million people joining together for a series on prayer. I'm telling you, that's, that's powerful. That is so cool. And here's what I told you last week about how it's going to happen. This is how it's going to go down. I said, first two weeks, I'm going to speak live here at the Experience Life campus. That was last week and this week. And then the following three, starting next week and the two weeks following that one, we're going to join some other churches across this country via video, and you're going to get to hear from some of the best communicators in the country over the next three weeks. It's going to be incredible. You won't want to miss it. Again, we're going to debut some of our video technology here, and so it's going to be awesome. But starting next week, we're going to join other churches via video, and you're going to hear from some of of the great communicators, some of the guys I look up to, and I think you will enjoy listening to them. Last week, we said this. We talked about why corporate prayer is so important, why it would be important for us to join with over 1,700 other churches to pray, why that would be important. And we said this. We said, closet prayer changes lives, but corporate prayer changes cities. Closet prayer changes lives, but corporate prayer has the power to change cities, nations, and the world. And this week, the One Prayer pastors have been challenged to speak on an attribute of God. So we have been challenged to, to complete this sentence. God is blank. I'm like, thanks a lot. You know, I could preach on that the rest of my life. God is blank. You know, talk about an attribute of God. So I start praying, God, what do you want me to tell him? Because, I mean, you're so great. I mean, I can't. How could we just do this for one week? God is blank blank and I prayed about it I said God how do you want to reveal yourself to us uh, this morning and I felt like this is what he was saying to me tell them remind them that I am that God is giving that God is giving that God is a giver I mean that just makes sense right we wouldn't even be here this morning we wouldn't be alive we wouldn't be breathing if God wasn't a giver I mean, because he's the one that gives us life and breath and everything we need to survive. He's the one that holds us together. The Bible says that he sustains all things by his powerful word. We would cease to exist if it wasn't for him. He's a giver. He's giving. The Bible says he gives us food and clothing and shelter, that he gives us our family, our mom, dad, brother, sister, spouse, children. You're like, some of those are blessings and sometimes other of those relationships aren't so much, depending on your life stage. But he's giving. He's a giver. He gives us our jobs. He gives us our money, our possessions. Guess what? They come from him. He's a giver. God is giving. Just who he is. The Bible says this, John 3, 16. We all know this verse. For God so loved the world, he did what? What did he do because he loved the world so much? He gave. God loved you and he loved me so much that he gave us his one and only son. Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago to die a horrible death on a cross for your sins and for mine. We broke God's law. Christ paid our fine 2,000 years ago on a cross because God loved us so much. He gave us his son. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 11, you don't have to turn to these places. I'll have you turn somewhere in just a second. 1 John 5, 11 says this, God has given us eternal life. What does that imply? Eternal life is a what? It's a gift. Eternal life is a gift given to us by God. Not something we work for, not something we deserve, not something we earn. Eternal life. Heaven, getting to be with God forever. In heaven, forgiveness of sin, it's a gift. God has given it to those who would receive it, to those who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. God's a giver. God's giving. The Bible says in 1 John 4.13, He has given us His spirit. The Bible says he gives us his spirit as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance to come, that we're one day going to spend eternity with him in heaven. The Holy Spirit is a guide for us. He resides within us as a comforter, a counselor, a helper. God's a giver. God's constantly giving. The fact that we're here is evidence that God is a giver, that he is giving, that he loves to give, that he's eager to give, that God is a giver, that he's giving. Now, I would say that I've always believed that. I think most of us would say, I've always believed that, that God's a giver, God's giving. I I would say I've always believed that. But sometimes I wonder if I really have always believed that. Because if I've always believed that God is a giver, that God is giving, then why have there been different points in time in my life where I didn't pray very much unless I was desperate? Hmm? 
If I really believe that God is a giver, that God is giving, then why have there been points in time in my life, maybe yours, where we didn't pray very much, where we didn't act like we believed that, unless we were desperate? Now, I'm like everybody else. You know, I pray a lot when I'm desperate. Most people pray when they're desperate, but sometimes we only pray then. Let me tell you about some of the times in my life I've been desperate and I prayed a lot. When I was 21 years old, I had not had a date in 10 years. <laughs> Took the ladies out when I was 11 years old, but you know, 21, man, I, just, I had not had a date in 10 years. What do you do when you're that desperate that in you know, 10 years you hadn't had a date and you're like, I don't know if I can ever get one. What do you do? You pray and then you change something. That's why I went from the comb over to the curly fro. Y'all remember that? That's why I went from driving a new truck to like a 12-year-old Honda Accord chick magnet. That's why I went, you know, from not playing guitar to playing guitar. Heard that drew the, the chicks, you know. So, I mean, I, I was desperate. So what did I do at 21? Because I was desperate. I prayed a lot. We all pray when we're desperate. When I was in college, I was almost done. Computer science degree, Texas Tech University is an engineering discipline. And so I was almost done with um, school. I had two classes left when I finished my spring semester. Two classes left. I saved the best you know, for last, which were calculus-based physics one and calculus-based physics two. Those are the weed out courses. You're supposed to take those at the front end, you know, whatever. I saved them for the end, all right? I'm thinking, that's intelligent. And so I've, I've got these two left. And so here are my options. Here are my options. I can stay at tech for another year, which I didn't want to do, and take physics one in the fall and then physics two the following spring. Or, yeah, or I could take physics one first summer session and calculus-based physics two second summer session. I'm like, sign me up, yes. And so I'm talking to my advisor, and he's like, dude, death wish. You take physics in the summer, death, you will die. You, I mean, seriously, you, it is bad, physics in the summer. I said, hey, you know what? I'm... I'm just going to get on my knees. I'm going to pray every day. I think I'm going to be fine, all right? So I sign up physics one, physics two. I'm taking it in the summer. Got to graduate in August. So I'm desperate. I'm going, I'm not good at physics. I'm a computer science major. It's not my deal, you know, but I got to pass this class. And so first summer session, physics one. Wasn't too bad. Wasn't too bad. Because in physics one, you can see stuff. Here's what I mean. Johnny pegs Susie with a ball. This is like on a test. Pegs Susie with a ball. It's going to this velocity, this trajectory. How long did it take the ball to hit Susie and leave a mark? You know, how far away was she standing? You can understand that, you know, pegging somebody. You've done that before. So you see physics. You see physics one. I did all right. Hmm. Then I got into physics two, second summer session. And after the first week in this class, I learned this. That during a regular semester, not the summer session, during a regular semester, in calculus-based physics, too, knew this professor. 50% of the class within the first week will drop. And 50% of the 50% that stay will fail. And so I'm like, oh. And I'm finding this out after the first week. I'm like, no turning back. They've already got my money. i got to do this. So what did I do since I was totally desperate? I prayed a lot. First test came back. I'm like, i got to pray some more. And so I, I'm just praying, you know, all the time. Before we hit the second test, you know what I was praying for before the second test? The rapture. I'm praying for Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, come back. Please spare me. No, I, no, I can't do this. I'm just rapture right now. Please. And, and rap, you know, we're still here. So um, anyways, and so that didn't happen. And so then I just start praying, God, I need the wisdom to have the right answers. And thankfully, I passed. Praise God. But uh, it was crazy, but I was done in August, didn't have to stay around another year. But because I was desperate, I prayed a lot. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I don't get sick a lot. But when I do get sick, I feel like I'm about to die. Now, how many of you guys with me? You don't get sick a lot, but when you get sick, man, it is death is heading your way. And anybody like me? I mean, I'd go to the doctor when I'm, I'm sick, and obviously I'm praying a lot because I'm desperate. I go to the doctor first, first line to the doctor, first question to him usually is like, doctor, will this sickness end in death? Because if so, just put me out of my misery right now because I cannot take this. When I'm sick, I get really desperate because I feel like I'm about to die, and I pray a lot. I'm like everybody else, and that when I'm, when I'm desperate, I find myself praying a lot, but sometimes I found myself at various points in time in my life only praying then. Anybody identify? Ever been there before? Maybe many of you would say, hey, that's kind of where I am right now. I pray, but it's really only when I'm desperate. Did you know that the average person only prays a couple of minutes a week if they pray at all? Average person only prays a couple of minutes a week if they pray at all. Question, because God is a giver, because God is giving, could it be 
that there are some things that we don't have now that we would have if we prayed more. Catch that? Because God's a giver, because God is giving. Could it be that there are some things that we don't have right now that we would have if we asked, if we prayed more often? More often than maybe a couple of minutes a week. I think the Bible has the answer to that question in James chapter 4. You got a Bible, let's go there. James chapter 4. You got one of these blue ones, it's on page 292. 292 in these New Testaments. James chapter 4, verse 2. We're just going to look at one verse today, but I think this one verse, if you catch this, can totally change your life. So one verse, I guarantee you'll have it memorized by the time we're done. James 4, verse 2. If you don't have a Bible, or if you don't have one in a translation that you understand, you're welcome to pick up one of these blue ones in the back there uh, on your way out. So James 4, 2, page 292 says this. Listen to this. This is crazy. You don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Whoa, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Another translation, New International Version says this, you do not have because you do not ask God. You do not have because you do not ask God. James here is writing to Christians and what is he suggesting? He's suggesting that there are some things that they don't have now that they would have now if they were to what? Ask. If they were to pray. Some things they don't have right now that they would have if they prayed. If they came to God and they asked for them. You don't have, the Bible says, because you don't ask God. Listen to this promise. You don't have to turn there. This is Jesus in Matthew 7, 7. Listen to this. This is, this is powerful. Ask, Jesus says, and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Now, don't miss this. Listen to this. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Can I read that again? If you then, though you're evil, if we, you know, we would admit, hey, we're not perfect, we've sinned, we've messed up. If we know how to give good gifts to our children, is what he's saying. And I love to give my daughter, McKinley, good gifts, of course. If we know how to give good gifts to our children. How much more will your Father in heaven, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? The Bible's saying God wants to give you and I good gifts continually. Just like a loving parent, he wants to give us good gifts. So here's the deal. You and I would be dumb and crazy if we didn't take him up on his offer to give us good gifts, right? We'd be crazy if he's saying, hey, look at what I've got. I want to give you good gifts. We'd be crazy not to ask for them and take him up on his offer. Now, that doesn't mean he says yes every time we pray for something. doesn't mean he says yes every time. But when we asked our parents for things, as children, and they didn't say yes, did, did that cause us to stop asking them for stuff? No, because they would say yes a lot of the time. Same, same thing with God. Some people just say, well, I prayed one time, Pastor, and God said no, so I just don't even pray anymore. That's crazy. That's crazy. He doesn't always say yes, but he says, I've got good gifts I, I want to give you. Would you just ask? Would you ask? Would you approach me like a loving parent and let me know what you need? Let me know even some of the things that you want. You need a job? We get a lot of prayer requests that we pray over on Monday nights. People looking for a job. Maybe they don't have one, or maybe you've got a job, but you want something different. You're just not passionate about the line of work that you're in. Guess what the Bible would tell us to do? Pray. Ask God. The Bible says you don't have because you don't ask God. He's a giver. He loves to give. He's eager to give. I remember when I was fixing to graduate from, from seminary. And didn't have a job, didn't have anything lined up, didn't know where I was going to go, what I was going to do. And so I start putting out resumes all over the state, just established churches. We hadn't felt called at that point, my wife and I, to start a church in Lubbock. So I was just putting out resumes at established churches. And you know what I got back from these churches over and over again? Can I tell you what I got? Rejection letters. Rejection like, no, we don't want you. Thank you very much for applying. You know, over and over again. I was like, God, I've got to have a job to provide for my to provide for my family when I get out of seminary. You gotta, you gotta help. You gotta give me a job. I mean, I was applying to churches in like Orange, Texas, okay? Because some of you are going, maybe you're just applying to big churches. You should apply to smaller churches. 
Orange, Texas. I'm sorry if you're from there, but I, I'm just going, you know, there's not many people there. And so I get this rejection letter from this church in Orange. It's like, hey, there's three people in our church, age 95 and older, and you're just not quite experienced enough to pastor a church of three. I'm like, there's no hope for me, you know, seriously. If I can't get a church in Orange, I'm in trouble, you know. And so I'm getting all these rejection letters, and I'm praying, going, God, all I know to do is ask. I, I need a job when I graduate from seminary. About that time, he began to lead us who were planning a church in Lubbock. And so he gave us a job, and we were excited about that, and he answered our prayers. You need a job? Ask him. You need financial help? You're going through a difficult time financially right now, and you need help? Guess what? Ask him. You don't have because you don't ask. He's a giver. So I had a job, right? So I'm coming back to Lubbock to plan a church. Here's the problem with church planning. It pays $0 an hour. All right? So now I've got a job. God, thank you for answering that prayer, but i got another prayer request right here because i got no money. You know, how am I going to make money? It pays zero. I ain't got nobody in the church. It's me and my wife. She can't pay me. You know, so I mean, uh, what, what are we going to do? God, we, we, don't have any, we don't have any money. And a couple called us and said, hey, we believe in the vision that God has given you guys, and so we'd like to provide your salary for you for the first two years of the church. We'd like to give you your salary first two years. I started getting paid by this church last month. <laughs> I hadn't gotten paid since the thing began because there was a couple that said, hey, we believe in it, man. And they said, here's financial support. That was an answer to prayer. God, you gave us a job, but now we need financial help. We're going through a difficult time. God says, I'll show up. You ask. I love to give good gifts to my children. Need a job? Ask. Need financial help? Ask. Need a spouse? Some of you single, you're going, 10 years, pastor, I'm right with you, man. You know, I need a spouse. I want to get married so bad. Ask. <laughs> ask. You don't have because you don't ask God. God's a giver. You need kids. Some of you want kids really bad, maybe you've been trying for a while. You're losing hope. Ask and keep on asking. Pray and keep on praying. Ask and you will receive, the Bible says. God is a giver. He loves to give good gifts to his children. You got kids, but they're hellions, and you need help raising them ask all right ask god that he would help you don't have because you don't ask god you need a house you need a place to live we get prayer requests like that sometimes you need an apartment or looking for a house or whatever ask you don't have because you don't ask god we got back my wife and i to, to lubbock and uh, bought a house and it's kind of small uh for us because the church was beginning to grow and we were filling up the living room we didn't have room for everybody and so we thought well we kind of need to sell this house and get into an older house so we get more square feet but how are we going to get out of it we've only been in it for a year and so there's no hope you know and so my wife does what she starts praying that god would help us to sell our house we didn't even list the thing a couple came to our life house one evening and said to us hey we'd like to buy your house for what you paid for it just straight up my wife's like where do i sign dotted line here we go sign right here you know and then we were able to buy an older home with more square feet so we could have more people in our home. She just started asking, God, would you help us to sell our home and, and get another one? Need a home? Need a place to live? Ask God. Do you need a miracle? Need a miracle? Ask God. You don't have because you don't ask. God's a giver, loves to give. Every Monday night at our prayer gathering, we pray for miracles for people that submit prayer requests that need a miracle. We pray and we believe that God still does miracles. And this last Monday night, a lady that goes to our church came and shared with us a miracle that she had recently experienced in her life in response to prayer. And I've asked her to share it with us again so that you all could hear it via video. Take a look. It all started with us noticing a knot. So we took our son to the dentist and they referred us to a surgeon and we took him to the surgeon to have the knot removed and they called us back and told us that it was cancer and so we come to church and we filled out our prayer request for for chris and we turned it into the to the box and very skeptical we were very skeptical about it and uh we we just let it go just let it go just gave it to god and said just just take this and, and take this cancer and be done with it and you know whatever happens happens and we'll go from there we got a phone call Sunday night the very same day we turned in our prayer request from a nurse who knew a doctor an oncologist who wanted to review his case before they started all the invasive treatments 
and they ran some tests and they came back and they told us that the knot and the cancer was gone. And that was just a few days after we turned in that request to, uh, to the church. And Barry called us the same day that we found out that it wasn't cancer and he told us that they had prayed for us and prayed for him and prayed for the healing of him. And he, he ultimately was healed. I mean, I, I can't say anything else about it other than the, we turned in our prayer request. We let it go, and our prayers were answered. My name is Julie Pearson, and God answered my prayers. How cool is that? She shared that last Monday night at our prayer gathering, and I'm telling you, the power of God fell on the place. And by the way, last Monday night, I gave a challenge last week, hey, once a month, join us for corporate prayer. Last Monday night, we had 125 e-lifers packed in that back room, sweating, you know, praying, and things like that. And so the challenge is still out there. Maybe you said, hey, I accept the challenge. I just couldn't come last Monday. Tomorrow night, we'll be there again. Monday night, 7 o'clock. Not awkward, not uncomfortable. Nobody's asked to pray out loud. But we just gather together corporately and pray for these things as people turn in prayer requests and as people come to the meeting with, with prayer requests. We pray because we believe we don't have sometimes because we don't ask God. He's a giver. He's giving. He loves to give. Need a miracle? Ask him. You want a family member, a friend, or a coworker, a neighbor to come to know Jesus? They're far from God. You want them to put their faith in Jesus? Ask him. Begin praying for them on a regular basis. You know, last Easter 2008, we prayed. <laughs> we prayed that 500 people would come to our Easter gathering. That was crazy. We were praying that because we, how, we thought, how cool would it be if 500 people heard the good news about forgiveness of sin being a free gift? And how cool would it be if of the 500, many of them put their faith in Christ? We prayed for 500. God sent 900 last year. This year, Easter, same reason, we prayed for 2,000, and God sent just under 3,000 people to join us. God, the Bible says, does exceedingly more than all we ask or imagine. Because he's a good God. He loves us, and he wants to give us good gifts. He's a giver. God is giving. You're like, Pastor, okay, got that. That's, that's great. I love hearing that. But what about the times in my life where I've asked and I have not received? Hmm? What about those times where I've asked and I haven't received? Let me give you three barriers to answered prayer. You might want to mark these down. Three barriers, I believe, to answered prayer. First one is this. Unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sin is a barrier, can be a barrier to answered prayer. Listen to what the Bible says. You don't have to turn there. But James 5 Verse 16 says this, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man, somebody who's confessed their sin and repented uh, from their sin, a prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. The Bible's not saying, God's not saying you gotta be perfect to pray. He's just saying, admit when you pray that you're not perfect. <laughs> confess your sin. Turn from it when you pray. And you'll see powerful answers to prayer. So one barrier to answer prayer is unconfessed sin. Another verse says in Psalm 66, 18, if I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. It's important when we come and when we pray and when we ask for things that the best we know how, we're saying, God, I confess I'm not perfect. I've walked the wrong way before. I'm trying to walk with you. I want to follow you. Second barrier to answer prayer is wrong motives. Second barrier to answer prayer is wrong motives. The Bible says this in James 4, 3. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Example of a wrong motive would be, hey God, because I want everybody to think I'm cool, I need a Corvette. God, I'm asking for it right now. The Bible says ask and receive Corvette right now. <laughs> it might be a, a wrong motive. We know that our motives are wrong when we desire our will more than we desire God's. We know that our motives are wrong, that our motives are awry when we desire our will more than we desire God's. Here's why. Because God's will, the Bible says, is good, desirable, and perfect. Is our will always good, desirable, and perfect? No. And God also has a different vantage point on life than we do. You know what that is? He knows the future. <laughs> he knows the future. So Jesus said that we should pray that his will 
would be done on earth as it, as it is in heaven. Why? Because his will is best. His will is perfect. His will is desirable. His will is unbelievable. It's better than yours. I got news for you. It's better than yours. I always tell you this. His plans for your life are better than your own. His will is better than ours. So we don't want to pray with wrong motives. Wrong motives can be a barrier to answer prayer. And number three, wrong timing. Wrong timing can be a barrier to answer prayer. The Bible says this in Galatians 4.4, 4, when the right time came, God sent his son. When whose time came? Our time? When people were praying? When their time? When, the, when their time came? No. When God's time came, he sent his son. When the right time came, he sent his son. People have been praying for the Messiah for years, hundreds of years, but he didn't come until when? God's timing. Why? Because God's timing is best. God's timing is right. God's timing is perfect. So sometimes when we pray, the answer to our prayer is yes, but wait. Yes, keep on praying. I'm going to answer that prayer. Just wait on my timing. Another verse, Luke 18, 1 says, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Always pray. If you believe it's according to God's will, always pray for that thing and don't give up. And eventually, God's timing will come and your prayers will be answered. If you overcome these barriers to answered prayer that I'm telling, you're going to see many powerful answers to prayer during the course of your life. Here's my question for you today, and then we'll be done. question for you is this. Do you want to experience all God has for you in every single area of your life? Do you want to make sure you have all he wants for you in every single area of your life? And I'm sure all of us in the room would go, yes, count me in. Yes, then guess what? We need to pray about every single area of our life. And that's going to take more than a couple of minutes a week. Listen to this quote. Martin Luther, great Protestant reformer in the 16th century, said this. Tomorrow I plan to work from early until late. Got a full day. Going to be really busy tomorrow, he's saying. In fact, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. <laughs> I've got so much to do tomorrow. I mean, all this work's piling up, whatever. I've got to pray for three hours before I get started just to make sure it all goes well. That's what he's saying. He's basically saying, hey, we're too busy not to pray. Sometimes we think we're too busy to pray. He's saying, guess what? We are too busy not to pray. So here's my challenge to you today. Here's my challenge. First five minutes of your day in prayer. First five minutes when you get up, could you just say, God, I give this day to you. Imagine what could happen if all of us spent the first five minutes of our day in prayer. Imagine the kind of day we might have. Imagine how God might give us wisdom in the decisions that we have to make. Imagine how we could have, God might give us favor with our boss or with our coworkers. Imagine how he could multiply our time and make us more effective in eight hours than we've ever been before. Imagine what could happen if just in the first five minutes of our day, we say, God, we're going to pray. We're going to pray and we're going to ask you because you're a giver, because you're giving to come and to do something awesome in our day. Imagine what could happen. Big idea today is this. It's basically the verse. Big idea. We don't have because we don't ask God. That's it. We don't have because we don't ask God. Some of you say, I've never memorized a Bible verse in my life. You got one right there, James 4, 2. You don't have because you don't ask God. And the most important thing we can ask God for is this. most important thing we can ask God for is eternal life. Remember in 1 John 5, 11, it says, God has given us eternal life. It's a gift. Maybe some of you are here today. You're not sure if your sins are forgiven, if God's forgiven you. You're not sure if you've got a spot in heaven. Maybe the reason you lack that assurance is because you've never asked him for the gift of eternal life. You've just always been trying to earn it yourself. Always been trying to work harder for it. So you'd never know if you've been good enough. Never know if you've done enough right things. Not what it's about. Assurance of heaven, assurance of sins forgiven is not about doing a certain number of things. It's about receiving a gift. Receiving a gift. It's called eternal life. And the way you receive it is by committing your life to Christ and just saying, Jesus, the best I know how, I receive it. I ask for it. I give my life to you. That's it. And so my prayer for this church is that we would experience all God has for us as a church. My prayer for you is that you would experience all God has for you in this life. And if we want to experience all he's got for us, then guess what we need to do a lot? We need to pray. We need to ask God that he would do something great in our church, in our lives in this city, in this nation, in this world. You don't have, sometimes the Bible says, because you don't ask God. Hope as a church that we will continually be found to be asking him, God, you want to give your children good gifts. We're asking that you would do it for us. Let's pray. God, I know that there are some people here today that would have to admit they don't have assurance that one day they're going to go to heaven. They don't have assurance that their sins are forgiven. They're hoping they're good enough, but they don't even know if they're good enough. 
And maybe they realize today it's not about being good enough. It's about receiving a gift. Jesus was good enough. We're not good enough. Jesus came 2,000 years ago, died on a cross for our sins, rose from the dead on the third day to offer to forgive us free of charge. And some of you here today, you know who you are. You need to receive that gift. Quit trying to work for it. Quit trusting yourself to get to heaven. Just say, Jesus, I'm trusting in you. I'm receiving the gift today. I'm committing my life to you. The best to know how I'm putting my faith in you today. Some of you need to, to do that right now. And you can pray and just say, Jesus, best I know how, I receive the gift. I trust in you. Forgive me, save me, assure me that one day I'll be with you forever. Just ask. You don't have sometimes because you don't ask God. And Lord, for the rest of us, I pray that we continually ask you for things, even when sometimes you say no, and you're going to say no sometimes because you know the future. You know things better than we do, and it's best that you say no. But a lot of the time, you're saying you're going to say yes. You're going to answer our prayers. And Lord, we want to be a church that sees powerful answer to prayer. We want to be a church full of people that love to pray and that believe in the promises that you've made us in Scripture and claim them. Ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for what the Bible has to say about this area of our life. And we leave here saying we know that we don't have because we don't ask, and so we're going to start asking you. We love you and we thank you in Christ's name. Amen.